calm down, man. People might see us. Oh my God, I'm starting to feel funny. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we were just off, off-roading. It's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like. This is the new 108,000 pound Mercedes GLS, and it's big, literally. It's one of the biggest SUVs in Europe with seven seats and masses of room for occupants and cargo. If you're looking for an extra large carry everything go anywhere monster, they don't come much better than this, probably. Before we get into the review, don't forget Auto Trader can help you buy, sell, and lease your next car. Plus, if you're curious about the value of your current car, we can help there too. Go to the website, put in your reg number and your mileage, and we'll give you a real accurate valuation based on data from millions of cars. Do it now. The link is down below. On with the show. Now, if you're wondering what all that bouncing was about at the beginning, we'll talk about it in a second or not. Now we will, it's a genuine feature. But first, let's talk about the design of the 2024 GLS. It's been revamped. So on the old car, you had two large horizontal bars across the front. Now you've got four large horizontal bars across the front with a large three-pointed star in the middle. The grille actually looks much bigger, much beefier, and much meaner than it did on the previous car. You've also got these gloss black accents around the redesigned air intakes, but they're not actually air intakes, are they? They are completely fake, but they do look vaguely cool, I suppose. And then you've got new headlights. So these are multi-beam LEDs, and each one has 114 individual LEDs, and apparently these are the brightest headlights allowed by law. If they were any brighter, they would actually melt any object within a two-foot distance. That's a lie. But if they were any brighter, they would be completely illegal. If you like driving down dark roads at night, this car's for you. Now, along the side, it's a big old brute, isn't it? It's like standing next to a block of flats, 5.2 meters long and taller than me. I'm 5'11 and this thing towers above me, enormous. You also get some new wheels. These are 23 inch, believe it or not. And they don't even look in proportion. They look too small. You could probably get away with 26 inches for goodness sake before it started to look like it was out of proportion. And the wheel designs themselves, quite nice. You get some nice little black brake calipers. And then down the side, you've got these running boards. Now on most off-roaders, SUVs, these are a bit of a gimmick, but on this car, they are very useful in terms of getting in and out of this thing because of the height that you've got to traverse to get inside. Door handles, normal. Door close sound, really good. There's also soft close. That's pretty handy. You've also got three large windows, one for the front, one for the middle row and one for the back row. Yes, this is a seven seater car. So even passengers at the very back get quite a large window, which is very handy. Now, around the back, not an awful lot has changed to be honest. It's quite a plain rear end, but it's still quite imposing. What you do get are a set of brand new rear lights, which are a little bit more fetching than the previous generation one. And you also get some GLS 450D badging in case you forget what car you bought. Very, very handy. The lower bumper is exactly the same as it was on the previous car, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my time on this one and just point out something that I don't really like, and that is Mercedes insist on having fake exhausts on their cars. Now to me, I, I just don't get why. I mean, one positive thing, if I'm reaching for positives, is that if children touch the exhaust, then they won't burn their hands. But you know what's going to happen, don't you? One day, a kid is going to walk up to a McLaren or a Ferrari, touch the exhaust, thinking it's fake and it's safe. They're going to burn their hand off, and it's all going to be thanks to Mercedes. Right, let's look at the boot. Okay, so the boot space is incredibly impressive. That is a total, believe it or not, of 470 litres, and that's 144 litres more than what you get in a BMW X7. And underneath here, loads of room for a spare tyre, which you don't get, but you could add if you wanted to, but also just for loads of your junk stashed away. That's pretty cool. And then there are two sets of buttons, one on either side. That set is for your second row of seats, and that set is for controlling your third row of seats. Let me demonstrate. I'm gonna push these and what you'll see is the headrest will fall. Oh, and then the seats will fold down. And then what you've got is a massive 890 liters of space. But if I come back over here and press the all button, what that will do is it will actually lower all of the seats in the second and third row simultaneously to transform the GLS from an SUV into a van. 
this is quite a cool touch as well. I'm going to show you this. So the parcel shelf can cover up what's in the third row. But if I very elegantly slide in here, what you'll see is that it can also very easily cover up what's in the second row. That is a nice touch. Plus it can fold away underneath the boot out of the way completely. That's huge. If you find yourself banished to the third row, things aren't as bad as you might expect. The second row folds out the way quite slowly to make room, so you'll need to be patient. But thoughtfully, if there's a baby seat installed there, Merck says it won't crush your child. Once you're in the very back, the space is huge, with seats that can accommodate people up to 1.94 meters tall, that's six foot three, with lots of headroom and decent legroom. You can even slide the second row forward to give yourself more legroom than I had here. In the back of the GLS, it's rather nice. Loads of room to lounge and relax. Good leg room, great headroom because it's so tall. And that's despite it having a panoramic glass roof. But the roof only goes back as far as the first and second row. No third row sunroof like you get in the BMW X7. Still, loads of space though. The seats are electrically adjustable. So they move forward and backward and they even recline as well. So you can get comfy on a long journey. This is cool. The headrests are also electrically adjustable. They go up and down to make sure your head gets the optimum contact patch on these lovely pillows. Very, very nice. And then in the middle, you got a load going on here. You've got a wireless phone charger. No USBs around here, mate. Well, there are actually, but you can charge your phone wirelessly. There is a uh, bit of storage for your loose change. And then, rather interestingly, there is a deployable tablet that allows you to control various features in the car, including your uh, climate control, your media playback, and they even serve as a remote control for these rear seat entertainment screens. I mean, look at this, that's, a, that's the off button for that. And I can turn this one off as well. It, it, all it does, it, it's like doubling up as a controller. So instead of doing that with your finger over here, you can, you can do it over here as well, which is um, rather disheartening because it's gonna cost a lot of money, isn't it? Speaking of rear seat entertainment, I also have a set of wireless noise cancelling headphones. The world has gone quiet. These are really nice. Um, but one thing I've noticed is that uh, the build quality might be questionable because no, that's fallen right out. Somebody has broken that. A little clip has gone. I'm not saying it's Mercedes's fault, but it's somebody's fault, isn't it? And it's not mine. Up front, again, very similar to the previous generation GLS, but that's not so bad. You get some really nice wood on the dashboard, wood on the center console, and some pretty nice leather up top. There are some changes though. You get a new steering wheel, unfortunately, because this is the one with all the capacitive buttons, so it's a bit annoying and you can accidentally press buttons that you don't want to press when you're driving along. But the screen, despite being the same as before, now come with the latest version of MBUX. The software is bang up to date. You can also customize the driver display by pressing the home button on the steering wheel and choose between sport, classic, navigation, and a few other options to make it look exactly how you want. Now, in terms of storage, it's pretty good. You can roll back this wooden center console effortlessly, like I just did. You'll find two cup holders. And what's interesting about these is that they're actually heated and cooled. If you've got a hot beverage, it'll keep it hot. If you've got a cold beverage, it'll keep it nice and cool. Good touch. You've got wireless phone charging, two USB ports, the old style mouse trackpad, which is uh, an option, really. You don't have to use that. You can just use your finger so that's fine and then down here you've got ample space in the center for carrying your bits and bobs you've got some nice ambient lighting if you want it yeah pretty decent right let's go drive it according to mercedes the gls is the s class of the suv world hence the s in gls and you know what it's not, <laughs> but it's not far off actually, because the first impression you get from this car is that it's really quite luxurious. It could have easily felt quite agricultural, but not a bit of it. It's very smooth, it's very plush, the seats are very comfortable. They almost feel like armchairs, although there is actually a bit of support in them. The steering is a little bit on the heavy side, but I don't want super light steering in a car that's as big and bulky as this. I want to be reminded of the girth 
of the henchness of what I'm piloting down the street. It's fairly quiet. I wouldn't say it's as quiet as an S-Class, especially because of the fact that it's got 23 inch wheels and they're absolutely enormous. So you do hear quite a bit of road noise coming up through the surface, but it's fairly plush considering it's a massive SUV. You could use this as a car to chauffeur your people around in and they definitely wouldn't complain. The suspension is definitely worth talking about. It's nice and plush. All cars come with air suspension as standard and I was bombing around some roads earlier with some horrible surface undulations and this thing just made short work of it. So if you live in an area with lots of potholes or uneven roads, you'll barely notice them in this car. Pretty soon I was interrupted by a large lorry turning in the road and a van trying to make space for it. Unfortunately, the van decided to make that space by reversing right into the GLS. Okay, so <laughs> the geese has just reversed into me. Right, I've got to go and deal with this now. I think, I think we got lucky. It's strong, it's strong. <laughs> right, so that is um, testament to how strong the front bonnet of the Mercedes is. It can actually uh, survive being reversed into by a Renault panel van. Should we carry on? Now, as I was saying before, I was uh, rudely interrupted by a car crash. Um, you have the option of getting the e-active body control, although it's only available on the Maybach version of the GLS. And what that does is it allows you to individually control each corner's spring and damping forces to make the suspension even smoother. It's also got a camera system that scans the road ahead, looking for imperfections in the road. And if it identifies imperfections, it can actually slacken off or tighten up the suspension to make sure you tackle those imperfections in an ideal way. That feature also allows the GLS's most impressive party trick, bounce mode, aka free driving assist. The idea here is that if you're stuck in sand or mud, the bouncing helps you bounce out. It also helps if you want to make people think you're getting freaky in the massive back seats. It's also got a curve feature. I don't know why I'm telling you all this, this car doesn't have it, but if it detects a curve, it will actually lean the car over by 2.6 degrees, a bit like a motorbike would do, so you actually lean into the corners. Very clever. But again, this doesn't have it. Speaking of things this car doesn't have, it doesn't have rear wheel steering. So I actually wanna check out what it's like to do a three point turn in this car. Although um, I feel like it will be more than three points on these narrow country roads, but let's give it a go anyway. All right, here we go. I'll pull to a standstill and see how many turns it takes to spin around. One point. Two points. Three. Four, five, I feel like Austin Powers, six. Okay, that's a seven point turn. Yeah, rear wheel steering would have come in really handy on this thing. The engine in the 450D is a three litre inline six diesel, which has 367 horsepower and 700 newton meters of torque. It'll do naught to 62, that's a bin man. Look, there's a bin man in front of me and the gap's not big enough to uh, go around. Shall I wait? Now, nah, I'm in an off-roader. We're gonna go up here. We're gonna go up here and round. That's the beauty of being in a GLS. Look at that, I could barely feel that. Like I was saying, the engine in the 450D is a three litre inline six with 367 horsepower and a pretty impressive 700 newton meters of torque and it will do 0 to 62 miles an hour in 6.1 seconds and 155 miles an hour flat out. In terms of responsiveness, well, I've got a few driving modes. Let's hit the dynamic switch down here and floor it. A Little bit of turbo lag, but once you're up and moving, it shifts all right for a car this big and this heavy. Not bad. You don't want to get too cocky with it in the corners though. It's good grip, but the car weighs 2.8 tons and there's a slight sense of unease, shall we say, when you go into a corner too quickly, partly because of the mass, but also partly because of the fact that you're sat so high up. It feels like you're driving a penthouse, but still quite capable for a car of this size. 
One of the clever things about this engine is that it has an ISG, an integrated starter generator, which is basically like a small motor, a belt that basically helps the engine in order to improve the smoothness and responsiveness of the engine, but also improve your fuel economy. Mercedes say this car can achieve 32 miles per gallon, depending on which options you fit to it, specifically uh, your wheel sizes. But on a day like today, with a driver like me, I am managing 16.5 miles per gallon. I'm not even going that quickly, but that figure does sound a lot more realistic than the Mercedes figure. A couple of cool things I've noticed about this car while driving it is the size of these sun visors. Absolutely enormous, but really useful, particularly today when we've got low winter sun. That's handy. And it's also got a fancy set of windscreen wipers with a system called Magic Vision Control. Now what it means is that the windscreen washers are integrated into the wipers and the water comes through tiny laser cut holes so it keeps the water nice and neat and reduces the amount of water you use but also keeps your visibility. On a normal car, you get water splashing all over the windscreen and that temporarily blinds you until it wipes it away but with this, it's always visible and the water is heated so it does a good job of actually removing frost and ice from your windscreen. Clever. In summary, I think this is a really cool car, man. It's enormous. It's a bit of a throwback. People don't make cars this big, especially in Europe, but it's nice to see that Mercedes are still producing big, chunky seven-seaters that have a lot of space for your stuff and your people. Some people say you never need an SUV this big, but I disagree. If you've got seven people to carry and a load of stuff and you occasionally want to go off-road, there aren't many cars that do it better than a GLS. <laughs>